Hey Danilla High School, this is Mr. Aiden and this is AP Chemistry Review. This is part two. And uh, we're going to go over a lot in this part two. We're going to take a look at stoichiometry. We're going to take a look at gases. We're going to take a look at solutions. We're going to take a look at thermo, kinetics, and electrochemistry. So this is going to be uh, pretty in-depth and hopefully you can quiz yourself and get totally ready for this. Let's take a look at stoichiometry, gases, and solutions first. If you're given the mass in grams, what are you going to do every single time? You're going to divide by the molar mass. And then remember, you can divide by liters to find molarity. So that's a divide, divide problem. If you're given volume of molarity, what does of mean? It means multiply. So we can multiply to find our moles and then multiply to find our grams by our molar mass. Any titration or dilution, what are we going to do? M1V1 equals M2V2. That's where we find our moles are equal. And then most pressure problems, if you see pressure, go write the Pivner. PV equals NRT. Just keep in mind, for all gas problems, get your temperature in Kelvin. Get your R in the point zero eight two one number. Let's take a look. Uh, if you're given mass or percentage and you want to find the empirical formula, remember, if you're given mass, what are you going to do right away? Divide by the molar mass. Get that into moles. And then once you get each one into moles, divide by the smallest one, that gives you your empirical formula. Remember, if you're given something like CO2, carbon dioxide, or water, and you're just finding the grams of just one thing, like carbon or hydrogen, you can set up a proportion. All you're going to do is grams of carbon times by its partial is part over whole, basically its percentage. And that gives you the grams of just carbon. You would do the same thing for just grams of hydrogen and water. And then, of course, again, you can set up another proportion if you're given total pressure and you want to find partial pressure. It's the same exact thing, isn't it? Total times your percentage, part over whole, gives you your part there. Okay. If uh, we have conditions for an ideal gas, what would the conditions be for an ideal gas? That would be high temperature, low pressure, low molar mass. That's what gases like to be at. Therefore, where would an ideal gas deviate would be low temperature, high pressure, high molar mass. What becomes more significant at high pressures and low temperatures and high molar mass? The attractions and the volume of each individual particle becomes much more significant. And what would be the best ways to dissolve a solid or a liquid to make a solution would be Higher temp, smaller surface areas, agitate it, greater kinetic energy, crush that solid down into greater number of surface areas. It's the same for reacting as well. And then conditions to dissolve a gas, where do we like our soda at for to dissolve that carbon dioxide inside that um, soda? Low temperatures, we like to cool down our soda, and we want it at high pressure. What would affect the kinetic energy of a gas? That would be, of course, absolute temperature. Only temperature affects the kinetic energy of a gas. But what would affect the speed of a gas, or we call that the RMS speed, the root mean squared speed of a gas? Temperature and molar mass. Greater temperature, greater speed. Greater molar mass, slower speed, right? And we call that effusion. And the rate of effusion, the lower molar mass, the faster. And remember, that's the square root of the ratio of the molar masses. Like if we have oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, oxygen gas is 32 grams per mole, hydrogen gas is 2 grams per mole, the ratio is 16. But it's not 16 times faster. Hydrogen gas is only the square root of that, 4 times faster. And then what happens when we change the state of matter? The temperature stays constant. And what's that energy going in the breaking? Not bonds but breaking the intermolecular force attractions between each molecule. When we take a look at uh, equivalence point, what is the equivalence point? It's where the moles are equal, where M1V1 equals M2V2. What's the end point? Where the color changes. Now, we like to get these to be exactly the same. If they put end point in a problem, you can assume it's the equivalence point. When we're halfway to the equivalence point, though, our pH is going to be equal to our pKa, and that's where we have a buffered solution. That will be a buffer. Now, what's the definition of a buffer is when we dissolve a conjugate salt in a weak aster base. Let me give you an example. Let me give you a weak acid and a weak base. Here's a weak acid, HF. We're going to dissolve NaF. That makes a great buffer. 
and NH3, if we dissolve NH4Cl, it's conjugate, salt, that makes a great buffer. Now guys, buffers don't work with our strong acids or bases. So something like NHCl, if I add NaCl to it, nothing happens. It doesn't do anything because we have a strong acid that dissociates completely. When we make solutions, the boiling point goes where? Up. Where does the freezing point go? Down. Where's the vapor pressure go? Down. And so what does the change in the boiling point depend on? It depends on the number of particles, and we call that the Van Hoff factor. And take a look at our Van Hoff factors here. Sugar breaks up into one particle. Salt breaks up into an Na plus and a Cl minus, two particles. And Na3PO4 breaks up into four big particles, three sodium ions and one phosphate. We're going to change it into thermo here. If you're given a list of reactions, what are we going to do? We're going to do Hess's law. We're going to either flip the reaction, which flips the sign, or we're going to multiply or divide our moles, which multiplies or divides our delta H. And then what do we do at the end is we add it all up. If you're given heat of formation, S of formation, or G of formation, use products minus reactants to give you the whole heat of the reaction, or the S of the reaction, or the G of the reaction. But don't forget, multiply by your number of moles. Okay. And if you're given bond dissociation energies, splitting up energies, remember the big thing there is draw out your molecules, draw out your bonds, and put positive energy for breaking bonds, that's your reactants. Put negative energy for forming bonds, that's your products, because breaking bonds needs energy, forming bonds releases energy. If we take a look at, we got to know our pluses and minuses for H, S, and G. H a plus is endothermic, it's, en or it's a reactant, it's absorbing energy, negative is exothermic, it's a product, it's releasing energy. S, positive means more disorder, negative means less disorder. Where are you going to find disorder? Go to states of matter first, then if the states of matter are all the same, go to the least number of moles would be the less disorder, more number of moles would be more disorder. And G, of course, is spontaneity. Positive means non-spontaneous. Negative, we know, means spontaneous. It happens. It occurs. Now, guys, sometimes it's negative, but it doesn't occur. And the reason for that is the activation energy is way too high. Now, guys, remember, whenever you do delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, get all your things in all kilojoules or all in joules okay you got to decide what you want to do but make sure your units are the same because s is often in joules per mole kelvin and delta h is usually in kilojoules and don't forget at equilibrium delta g is 0 which means delta h is equal to t delta s when uh, let's get in the kinetics here, uh, let's define a catalyst. What is a catalyst? A catalyst lowers that activation energy. It, that's all it does. It's not in your reaction. It's not consumed. It's not produced. It's at the beginning. It's at the end, and it has not been used. The intermediate is produced, and then it's consumed. So an intermediate is a product, and then it's immediately a reactant. What would increase the rate of reaction? We got four things: increased concentration, higher kinetic energy crush it up more surface areas and add a catalyst and remember if you're doing a rates of appearance or disappearance just do stoichiometry just do molarity per second and divide by your number of moles do a molar ratio is all you're doing for that so just set up a proportion let's go into the, the second part of kinetics which is whenever you're doing whenever you've been given initial rates of reactions Write it like this, rate 2 over rate 1 equals Ka to the x, b to the y, and plug in your data to justify your answer. Once you find out what K is, remember your units for K. If you're overall third order, how many molarities do we got to get rid of? Molarity to the negative 2. We always got to get rid of a second, second to negative 1. Whenever we're given um, something with time, though, we can figure out whether it's zero order, first order, or second order by taking a look at how it graphs. If we have concentration versus time and we get a straight line, which is a negative slope, which is negative k, that would be zero order. If that doesn't work and we use natural log of a and we get a straight line, that's first order. And the slope is still going to be negative k. But if we that doesn't work 
and we graph 1 over the concentration, that's second order. And the slope is going to be positive k on that one. And so that is called my integrated rate laws there. Remember, half-life of a first order reaction, we've got to know that equation. Write that down, get that, get that in your mind so that um, as soon as you get your test, write that down because it might help out. 0.693 over k is my half-life for only first order reactions. And guys, most of them are first order reactions. Remember, mechanisms, we're looking for the slowest step. That's our rate determining step, and that tells me how many moles are in my rate law for um, whether it's zero, first, or second order. If you're giving K in temperature, guys, we can find activation energy by graphing the right things. Go to your equation sheet. There's a really nice formula that's, that's in a Y equals MX plus B formula, and you'll find out on the Y it says natural log of K. On the X it says 1 over temperature, not just temperature, 1 over temperature. And my slope is going to be negative Ea, that's my activation energy, over R, which is my 8.31 number. And keep in mind, if we increase our temperature, that increases our K, our rate constant, which ultimately changes our big K for equilibrium. Electrochemistry is kind of the last thing we're going to go through here today. Electrochemistry, the spontaneous reaction we know is a positive E. Positive E is going to give us a negative G, and that's called a cell potential. Here, take a look in this cell. We have zinc plus 2, we have silver plus 1, and you can see if it is a, if it is a spontaneous reaction, I need to flip the zinc reaction. And the reaction that I flip is going to be the oxidation reaction because losing electrons is oxidation. And remember, all our reactions are already in reduction form, so if you keep that the same, that's your reduction reaction. And remember, the flipped reaction is your oxidation one. Now, the one that you flipped, which is oxidation, is your anode, because anox, red cat, and the electrons always flow from the anode to the cathode in alphabetic order. Keep in mind, our salt bridge our salt bridge has to be something like NaNO3 or KNO3, something that's going to be spectators everywhere. And your initial concentrations will always be one molar. And in order to find my E, all I have to do is, once I flip my reaction, add them up. And I can easily find my delta G, my Gibbs free energy, my spontaneity, by negative N, that's the number of electrons, F, which is that 96500 number, and my E, the one that I add, add up. And remember, if I add reactants, it's going to make it more spontaneous. It's going to push it forwards, which means the E goes up, more spontaneous. And that is all of the stoichiometry, electrochemistry, kinetics, thermo, solutions, gases, everything. I hope this helped, and I hope, uh, hope you're studying and going to do well on uh, Monday morning. All right, see you guys. Bye.